morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Jeanette Meller. I am the director of the corporate innovation and entrepreneurship major within the Smeal College of Business at Penn State. I also am the associate director of the Farrell Center for Corporate Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And as faculty within the Smeal College of Business, I believe I have one of the coolest jobs on the planet. I get to work with inspiring students and entrepreneurs every, every day, both in the undergraduate and the MBA program. Tonight, as part of Startup Week, we have an inspiring keynote. And Startup Week connects students with innovative alumni and pioneers who have achieved success in a variety of industries and disciplines. There are over 80 virtual events this week, and there's basically something for everyone. The cornerstone of the university is our inspiring students, and Leonardo Gerlando is one of these incredible students. He's multilingual, multicultural. He's a finance major, and he has minors in both Chinese and information systems. He's also a Schreier's Honors student. In addition, he's the president of Happy Valley Capital, a student org that is acting as the hub for funding and information for Penn State startups. As the faculty advisor for Happy, Capital, Happy Valley Capital, I know his level of commitment as he has dedicated over 40 hours this week and last week just to the Startup Week, act, uh, Startup week activities in addition to his full-time studies. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Leo, who will be our moderator this evening. Thank you very much, Dr. Miller. Appreciate the kind words and, and welcome everyone and thanks for joining us today. With that, um, I'm really honored and happy to introduce you and give you a little content of our keynote for the night, flipping the script, funding alternatives for your startup featuring Matt Racina. So as a quick overview, Matt is one of the Penn State's most successful tech alumni entrepreneurs. Growing up in State College, Matt knew from a young age that he wanted to start his own company. Starting with childhood business ventures, Matt learned early on that working for himself gave him the satisfaction to both love his work and make a living by his own rules. At Penn State, Matt took advantage of the college experience at sealing inside and out of the classroom. At Triers of Engineer graduate, Matt went on, the, on to graduate school and eventually moved across the country to Silicon Valley, where Matt's entrepreneurial interests turned into multi-million dollar companies, including Sutney and Sincerely. Matt's story, like most entrepreneurs, is full of twists and turns, highs and lows. Despite it all, he figured out how to traverse rocky Silicon Valley terrain to secure funding for his various ventures. During tonight's keynote event, we'll dive into Matt's experience has, that how has gone from seeking funding to being an investor and the way he has developed his passion, not only about startups from a founder's perspective, but also from an investor's perspective. With that, Currently, Matt is a twice exited founder, including Shopney, which was acquired by Yahoo and sincerely acquired by FTD. Matt is an investor in over 80 startups, including Dropbots, Ring, Cruise, Snapdocs, Tonal, and Jump. With that, I'll more, I'm happy to welcome Matt to the stage. Welcome. Hello. Hey, everybody. So, Matt. With that, um, I would love to kick it off to know a little more about your entrepreneurial experience. So can you describe to us, how was your path with uh, leading companies like Sophie and Sincerely? Yeah, so I, after Penn State, I felt like I needed to, um, to get a deeper technical understanding in a certain area to be able to go start a company. And so that's the reason I went to grad school and I went and studied control systems and while I was there, I found out that like things were just getting more theoretical and theoretical, and it wasn't actually getting me closer to starting a company. Um, it ends up that like most of the things that you need to learn to um, start a company, you figure out just by jumping off the cliff and figuring it out before you hit the ground. And so after three years of kind of struggling through, through grad school and not really getting to this goal of starting a company, I hopped off. Um, and joined a friend of mine uh, up in Cambridge, Massachusetts as one of the first 20 companies backed by what's now famous Y Combinator. So we were lucky to be very early funded by this organization that took bets on you know, grad school dropouts like me and my co-founder. 
And um, yeah, the journey started there. It took me, you know, to over $45 million in, in VC financing. I've been through all the ups and downs of building startups. And now what I do is uh, help founders go through that same journey I've been through, hoping to save them a little bit of agony and help them be more successful. So tell us a, a little bit about the co-founders. How do you know that they were the right teammate? How do you went about recruiting them? Mm -hmm. So my first co-founder recruited me. Um, and what you really want to look for in a co-founder is one, somebody that you trust and have a personal relationship with that's like beyond just starting a business together. It's much like getting married. Um, so you want somebody where you have that intimate trust. And then... Um, you know, I do think it's powerful to have somebody with complementary skills. So my co-founder that recruited me into the first startup we did together, he, you know, is less successful or less comfortable just talking to random people. You know, I selling programs at Penn State football games learned how to talk to thousands of people in a very short segment to get them to buy something from me. Um, and so I'm quite comfortable with that. But yet I had the technical background to be able to bridge that gap. And so my co-founder saw that in me. And, you know, that's why he recruited me. And then we would divide roles in the company based on this. You know, I wrote some software early on, but like it would take me a day to what he could do in 90 minutes. Whereas I could do things like go out and secure the first $4 million in funding. I could help recruit new employees. I was better at like talking to customers. So um, it's different in every company, but we do see a pattern over and over again where you generally have what's for, for tech companies you have one co-founder that's like deeper in the tech and spending all day in that another one that you know you could call sales or just you know out more outgoing part of the business i did the yeah, latter and, and and what's your take on solo founders it can it can work um i usually see it work better for second time founders um because Founding a company is such an emotional ride. Like you're actually, with a co-founder, you're really depending on that person. Um, so sometimes solo founders work better when it's second time. They've already been through the roller coaster. They have the relationships. It's harder for, especially if they've been successful before, then it's harder for them to find somebody who really is worth giving like half the company to. A common pattern these days is like a very experienced founder will bring on a founding team. These people will have high equity, but won't be necessarily co-founders, like in terms of the equity ratio. Um, solo founders can be quite successful. I will say on my second company, I still wanted like that equal co-founder. That's what I did. I had a 50-50 co-founder. I actually met him in Y Combinator. He was running another company with a different co-founder. I actually hired him at my first company. He worked for my first company for, for four years. And then after we had both left there, we came together to work on this new concept. And him and I, you know, we worked on that two and a half years built, you know, from start to selling. And then, you know, for a couple of years afterwards at the acquirer. That, and that partnership as a mature founder, I, it was even better. Like we were a better fit for each other. And we were both just personally more mature. First company, I was like 24 when I started it. Second company, I started at 28, 29. And um, with that maturity and experience, like we knew our roles, there was more trust and we were more successful in a lot of ways because of it. Definitely. Um, we do have a question in the, in the, uh, in the Q&A section and this was for Christian Park and he would like to ask you, where would be the best place to look for a partner with skills that complement yours? An example is that he's a physician looking for a partner with a tech background for med tech startup. Yeah, um, so the thing that's common among founder type people is that they try to go create things in the world that don't exist or somebody else's. They're like, why isn't anybody doing this? This needs to exist. And so what I suggest is that you find projects like that, that might not even be a business. Uh, for example, one thing I was working on a lot today and I've been working on a lot, a lot the last few days, I don't get paid for, but it's work that I'm doing to try to um, create more car free spaces in our city of San Francisco where people can travel by alternative modes safely. And this is a side project. You know, I'm doing it in my extra time, but I'm meeting other builders and other entrepreneurial type of people doing this. One of them could turn into my next co-founder. And so for this person, I'd say, hey, find those things in your community where other smart people are drawn to just work on problems and just like do some projects with people. Um, and then, you know, there's nothing wrong with just like hitting the phones and combing through your network. It's 
amazing. I feel like you don't understand this when you're in college. I didn't, or before then, or even for a lot of people after then, that like these relationships that you build in the dorm room or on the basketball team or in the band that you're part of end up being so valuable, you know, 10, 15 years into your career. I mean, I ran for student government at Penn State. The guy who I was VP, what ran for VP, we, we, we lost by the closest margin in Penn State history at the time. Uh, we were second place, but I ran for VP. The guy who recruited me, he ran for president. He's now a lawyer and, you know, I'm working on this project with one of my companies. Lawyers are a really important channel for us to work through. And he, um, he just helped us out majorly. Like we reconnected, you know, we like, we had a business reason to, to work together. And the way that it started was us running for student government 20 years ago. 20 That's years. awesome. Yeah. Almost 20 years off. <laughs> That is awesome. Wait, yeah. so um, I'd like to know a little more about how, how was your fundraising experience? Yeah, uh, like going way back? Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. So I raised my first funding in 2006. And the startup world was wild, wildly different then. There were very few people just like writing checks to 22, 23 year olds that wanted to build a business. And luckily, we just happened to be readers of Paul Graham's essays. and He's like, you know what? I'm going to give students money to like go work on startups. So we just happen to like be part of that early group. Now they're funding 300 companies every six months. When we did it, they would fund like eight companies twice a year. Um, so that was our first funding and it was, you know, their application process. But from there, you know, we, um, we didn't have like the demo days that people have now where there's like hundreds of investors paying attention. We had the demo day with like five people and we luckily got one of them to invest in us. He was the, the guy who created Gmail, which was really important given our first business was an email business. And that helped give us a little breathing room. It was like a hundred thousand um, dollars. But we knew we needed to raise more because we we're going after a really big problem. So we started pitching all these VCs in Boston and they were just used to the old model of like, Hey, you have like a gray haired CEO and like somebody who worked at Oracle for 15 years and we just didn't look right to them. We would leave these meetings and they'd send us an email and be like, oh, you should meet my friend, Jim. He's got gray hair and like fits our profile. And uh, my co-founder are like, this sucks. And then the Gmail guy was like, hey, come out to California. I'll introduce you to some of my early Google friends. So we went out and it was just like, these guys are amazing. They're willing to bet on young people. And that, that kind of sparked this conversation with a lot of investors. We ended up raising 4 million bucks within a couple months um, from a legendary investor. Um, and then from there, you know, that company, that first company raised over $45 million. Um, you know, after the seed, after the seed and kind of series A stage, it's, you really raise money based on traction. And we just had a lot of people using our product. I mean, we had like 30% of the employees at Microsoft using our product. Bill Gates was demoing our pr product on stage at conferences. Um, it was in the New York times and Washington post. And so that stuff worked for this, the following financings. My second company. Excuse me while I take a drink. My second company, um, you're like now a founder who's like built something that's raised lots of money. You have the experience as an investor now, like that's when our mouths water and uh, we are all very excited about trying to find people like that. So it was literally over a breakfast with an investor that I had kind of gotten to know. He's like, oh, I really like, what we were kind of just bootstrapping an idea. He's like, I really like this. He's like, um, what if we invested 3 million bucks? And so like at breakfast, I didn't even go do a pitch, um, he, he invested. Now raising after that became hard because we raised that 3 million bucks, we got good traction, but the business wasn't hockey sticking as we like to say, it was just kind of on a linear growth plan. It did not look like a high growth opportunity. We hadn't really cracked that. And so I started doing like a bigger fundraising for a series B, if you want to call it that. And um, in parallel, I had inbound interest for M&A and a lot of my advisors and friends, that I confide in were kind of like, hey, given what's going on with the tra trajectory of the company, like you're probably gonna be more successful selling than uh, raising a round right now. And so we ended up selling the business. It was only in two and a half years. Everybody made money, it wasn't a huge outcome. I mean, it was great for my co-founder and I and employees, but um, uh, you know, that was hard. Fundraising's, fundraising's hard, it doesn't always work. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And, and I'm curious to know, so, Given the financial crisis, you know, 2007, 2008, was your, you know, fundraising experience in 2011 markedly different? 
yeah. than the one previously the from the front the from the financial crisis uh i would say the bigger influence on all the fundraising actually has been just what happens with the startup market that's more important than what happened in the financial crisis so my first company we raised four million dollars and sold half of the company now you raise four million bucks at that same stage you're selling 20 percent or less of your company i mean that's that's dramatic and that's simply because of uh, you know how large the big tech companies have gotten, and so therefore investors are thinking like all of these companies can be worth bill you know not all but like they all have an opportunity to be worth a billion or ten billion or a hundred billion dollars. Back then, people didn't think our little startups could be worth something that big. So I'd say the microeconomics of the startup ecosystem are more influential than the macroeconomics of. The financial crisis or this COVID crisis or um, interest rates, you know, those have influence. But um, the bigger thing is like tech itself. I mean, like everybody wants to work at a startup now. There was no Penn State Startup Week when I graduated high school, college or even five years afterwards. And now, you know, people are talking about it. Just wasn't a thing. Yeah. Um, so we have a couple of questions from the Q&A. And this one's from Isabella Queen. And she would like to know, how would you recommend to to increase, how would you recommend for increasing an insurance engagement and support from investors? Increasing the basically engagement from investors? Correct. Um, I'm sure you can't ask her a follow up, but um, you know, there's a difference between investors that are on your team, they've invested in you versus investors that you're trying to get on your team. I, I'm kind of guessing this, this question is for people you're trying to get on your team because that's the harder part. And in that case, um, I think what the best founders do is they find a warm connection to you. So find somebody who knows me that, that also knows you and have them broker an intro. Just the, the friction of that and the relationship credibility that's required there re basically opens me up to a conversation because I have to have a filter. I get so many DMs from people trying to send me decks. Um, and then... I may or may not click with your business, but a great thing to do is to say, hey, can I add you to like our investor updates? And I encourage every founder to be sending monthly investor updates during the first several years of their company. So I can, I'll look at those. I love reading about businesses and what founders are building. And in that up, those updates, I can start to see like, oh, this is working. Oh, there's some traction here. Oh, I really like how they think. Then when I re-engage, you can re-engage with me. I actually have context to your business, to how you're executing, how you communicate. Um, and I, you know, I'm like, you've warmed me up basically. It doesn't mean I'm going to necessarily invest. I still have to like love the business and the opportunity, but, uh, that's one of the best ways I've seen for people to do it. Yep, definitely. So after, you know, this awesome experience as founder, part of this really great teams, then you decided to become an angel investor, right? So Walk us through that, you know, shift in, in, in career, essentially. And then why do you prefer to be an angel investor versus perhaps joining a venture capital firm? Yeah. Okay. So I, I kind of accidentally became an investor. Um, the reason being, so I always felt like, even back when I was running like my lawn mowing business in junior high, I felt like, hey, I'm making this money. And then I'm just like, it's sitting in rolls of cash in like a trophy I had in my bedroom the bank account's going to give me like half a percent. And I'm like, isn't there a way to make more money here? And the way to make more money with your money is to invest in other people's businesses. So I actually started doing that when I was 12 years old, you know, took my, had my mom take me down to Edward Jones and I started buying some stocks. And so I, so I started doing that like in the public markets through into high school or into college. It was really great because I learned with small amounts of money then. Um, but basically, you know, buying upside in other people's businesses. So I was comfortable with that. And then what happened was, you know, I, we would try to hire somebody like the founder of Dropbox, right? He was working on my apartment on another idea before Dropbox was his idea. And we tried to hire him as like our first employee at my first company. And he's like, uh, we offered him 4%. He wanted 8%. We said, that's too much. We can't do that. He's like, okay, I've got this other idea. I'm going to go start. He now runs a $10 billion public company. Well, you know, we were just like, my co-founder, like, he's one of the smartest people we know. Um, could we just invest in your company? So we invested. <laughs> you know, we had um, employees, our employee number two and number five that actually joined our company, met our, our company, spun off and started Dropcam, which sold to Google for, you know, $500 million. It's like, 
invest in these smart people that you meet building projects or working on companies with you. And so that's how my investing started. Actually, my second investment was in a friend from State College, a guy I went to high school with, went out to Stanford, started a company, asked me you know, to help since I had already started companies before. I invested, uh, we ended up selling that to Dropbox, which I helped with. Um, and so I just kind of like invested in friends. And then it was probably after selling my second company when I had a little bit more time and other investors kind of saw, they're like, oh, Matt's done pretty well investing in these companies. They started giving me a little bit of money to invest alongside of my own. And so then I kind of like stepped it up a little bit, started doing, you know, maybe 10 companies per year. I'm pretty, I think I might be close to 85 or 90 now. Um, I've had like 15 companies sell. Uh, I now have a small fund that I invest out of, but I still consider myself an angel investor because of the size of check that I write and the fact that every check that I write, it's other people's money, but I am the largest piece of the check I write, which I really like. That means that I'm taking like, it's my money. It's not just other people's money. So is it like a syndication kind of process? It's, a, uh, it's not a syndication. I will syndicate deals sometimes if they're larger and I can't do it out of my fund, but I have like a $10 million fund that I raise the pool of capital from, frankly, all these entrepreneurs I mentioned, founders of Dropbox and Ring and Mailbox. And um, it's basically people that I've backed before and I've worked with, they've invested in me. My co-founders of my company, they've all given me money, said, hey, you're good at this. We wanna invest alongside of you. And so I have that pool of capital and I usually write 150 to 200K checks into companies. And like I said, I'm the largest part of that. Yeah, definitely. So. Before we jump uh, to a little more about fundraising, uh, investing questions, I there's a question by Tash Tripathi who he wants to know, so given your spend your blood, sweat and tears building stop me sincerely over a long period of time, do you maintain some involvement or decided to move away from the companies and enjoy the rewards of the exit? And a follow up to that is, what factors went into deciding to exit versus saying no to offers and continue building? Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So technically like the involvement, how it worked was first company, I actually left before we sold, we hired an external CEO. And so in that case, I just stayed on, on the board, you know, I was involved in like, Hey, you know, what's the login for this account or something, or like somebody asking a question about like, you know, Hey, what do you think we should do with this? But like, I wasn't day to day working on it. I traveled a bit and I had started another company already, but I stayed on the board which is really important because then you have influence over your shares that are still in the company, uh, as well as other common shareholders, which you represent. And so that was really important in terms of when we did sell the business to Yahoo, it was a big ass negotiation with lots of competing interests. And we really stood up for ourselves and other common shareholders. And I'm really glad we did. So having that board seat was critical. The second company, um, I executed the transition as the CEO, the, the, the sale. And part of that deal was that they you know, paid for the business up front, but then they also had a strong earn out for my co-founder, myself and my team. And so I was incentivized to stay for like two years because that plus, you know, we were bought by a public company. That was really interesting. Um, not a, that well of a run public company, but like I learned a lot being there. And so I stayed involved. I'll tell you like, so now I'm like not involved. And in fact, that company has gone bankrupt and sold the sincerely assets and business and product to another company. Um, and like, I still get phone calls from like customer service. Sometimes people find my number on the internet. Um, so I'm like, you can never fully escape, but um, I'm not that involved with either of them now. Um, yeah. And then the, the decision to sell in both companies, I mean, it is, um, some, it's, you know, sometimes it's like, it's just like the right thing to do for the business. Like in both cases, we were really, neither of my companies like, you were very nice intro. Matt's like a very successful entrepreneur, like reasonably, but not like, I'm not, you know, I'm not the friends that you, you know, you have to go through three people to, to schedule today. Like these companies, they were good. They weren't, I did not start a public company. They are not on, they weren't on that trajectory. And so selling them was kind of a strategy of like, Hey, we're really valuable to these certain acquirers. And this path to us becoming like a public company is like, not that clear. <laughs> So maybe it's time to ring the bell and, and like take a win now. And that's, that's what happened with both my companies. I've been part of other companies where they're growing so fast 
people are trying to buy it. And then the founder's like, I'm never going to find something that's growing like this again. That's what happened with Dropbox. I have other investments yeah. like that. You know, another company called Grailed, where they're just like, yeah, I could sell it for 300 million bucks, but like, you know, how do I get to this point? I've spent seven years getting to this point. I have like a company I love, product that I love, com- customers I love. So um, different depending on how your business is going. Yep, that makes sense. So we have a question that I think would fit nicely to where we're going in the conversation from Michelle Indola. And she'd like to know, when starting your own small company, is it better to start off self-funded or perhaps bootstrap your company? If you cannot self-fund yourself, at what point does it make sense to reach out to others for help? And how should you make the first approach? Yeah, um, you want to have, you want to get, war- you want to make progress and get things done without requiring other people's money. So if you want to call that bootstrapping, sure. Like, are you doing this on the side, like in the weekends and the evenings after your normal job? Are you consulting, you know, 10 hours per week and then building? That's by the way, what I did actually on both companies um, to try to like pay the rent while trying to work on the business. Because like investors aren't just going to invest in an idea. I almost never, like I never do that. Unless it's like somebody I've backed before, I've seen them execute. And it's like, okay, you're building a new thing here. I'm going to invest. But generally, show me the money. Or not show me the money. Show me your work. Show, like, show me your progress. Like, what am I buying? And there's not much of something to buy until you've actually made some progress. So I really encourage people to find like the simplest things that you can do that show results. And show me you can build. A lot of people can't build. They're like, I got this idea, but like, I need to hire an app developer. I hear that all the time. I'd rather invest in the app developer that's actually yep. building. Yep, definitely. So build, we actually build. We do have actually a question that fits nicely with that from Samuel Presser, who who would like to know maybe what are some of the most hot skills that you're looking at founder? And he goes and mentions perhaps information science and coding skills, but do you have any you would like to add to that list? Yeah, I really like investing in software companies. They have low capital requirements which means as an early investor, there's not much dilution. Um, as well as if, you know, if, even if you're building hardware, you know, a lot of these hardware companies like Ring that I mentioned, like there are actually more people working on software there than there are on hardware. So software is eating the world. Software is eating money right now. Like what's happening around crypto, that is software eating money. Software, 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 software. So yeah, um, every team that I invest in has you know, people that are good at software, which is writing code, you know, developing backend systems, uh, great, uh, great design skills, particularly around user experience that that's not actually writing software, but it's pretty darn close in terms of its value to the ecosystem. Um, those are the most important things. And, and then, you know, we, like I said, from the beginning, it's great if there's somebody that can do that. And there's somebody else that's like really good at talking to customers and selling. Somebody that's good at getting money in the door. I do like to. I do like people that can sell, um, because the process of building a company, especially as a CEO, is basically selling twelve hours a day. You're selling employees on why they should take your equity and join you and leave another job. You're selling their spouse on why they should take the risk on your business. You're selling investors. You're selling uh, your customers. Sell, 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 sell. Yep, definitely. Actually, just to take it back on, on that question and software, uh, Dia Rusagi would like, like to know, what are your thoughts on healthcare software companies? Healthcare software? Yep. Yeah, I, um, one of my best investments out of my fund right now is a nurse staffing uh, marketplace and software solution for hospitals, for large hospitals. Um, I, think, I think maybe a third of the investments in my current fund hit health tech. Health, um, especially in America, we are all quite aware that like the price of healthcare has gone through the roof and the quality is um, not been commensurate with that increase in cost. And this is where software um, does its best work. Like software is great at reducing the costs of things like higher education. The cost of that is being reduced because people are getting the best teachers in the world to be able to offer um, you know, uh, courses online or software is eating finance instead of having like all these people pushing paperwork inside of a bank. Like we now have smart contracts on the blockchain where 
software is actually making sure that your you know counterparty is doing what they're supposed to do. So um, healthcare is one of those spaces, like the, and it's it's one of the largest segments of the economy. So like the big things that we look for are uh, these next waves where a part of the economy is going to get disrupted. Here's the things that I would not want to own right now. I would not want to own an oil business because it is being uh, disrupted by the technology of solar uh, and the political climate of moving away from fossil fuels. Um, I also would not want to own major banks, bank products, traditional banks. Uh, they're being disrupted by the next wave of FinTech as well as uh, crypto technology. Um, and other huge areas of opportunity, education, it's another thing where we've seen costs skyrocket whenever software will hit that. It's starting to, those costs will come down. Um, health tech, which is where we started. Also, I think um, transportation is a really big area too, a huge part of the economy. So yeah, big opportunity in health tech. Awesome. So I want to take it back to more of the investing side and, and your experience as an angel investor. So what are some of the common mistakes entrepreneurs make when, when seeking angel investment? Uh, back to one of our other things, uh, kind of getting too focused on raising money and not on making progress on your business. So you should be building every day. Um, in fact, it'll probably make you better at fundraising if you focus more on building. Actually, one of the best <laughs> things for an investor here from a founder is like, I can't like, we're not focused on fundraising right now. We're heads down building. Here's a graph of like our growth. <laughs> like, ah, let me add it. What do I have to pay? Oh. Um, so yeah, I would, I don't know. I don't know what to like avoid. Um, it is, it is valuable to build personal relationships just like you do in anything. So like, again, go after those like warm introductions. Um, try to connect with people in ways that are outside of business. Like, Hey, if they're really into like mountain biking, like maybe there's, um, you just don't want it to be too manufactured, um, that you're just trying to like go mountain bike with them because they can like invest in your company. So, um, I don't know if I have much more of an answer to that. Yeah, no, that's, that's perfect. Um, we do have uh, a question from Christian again, and he'd like to know, as an angel investor, what is an immediate red flag or a story perhaps? And, and what is the most important thing that you need to hear when you make an investment decision? Okay, immediate red <laughs> flags. Uh, it's an immediate red flag if there's like some unexplained real disparity between the shareholders of the company, like the founders, like one is like, I'm 90%, the other one's 10. It's like, why is this like this? Or if there's some co-founder that was there that owns a bunch of the company that's not involved anymore. Um, most, yeah, most of the red flags are just like people things. Um, uh, like a really polished like presentation, but no, yeah. they haven't built anything other than a presentation. Um, if, if they list like all these like big advisors and stuff on their deck, but then like they haven't built anything, they haven't sold anything. Um, lots of startup competitions. I don't know, actually it's not that negative, but it's kind of just like this over-focus on funding versus focus on customers. The best yeah. founders are just obsessed with their customers and they just build, 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 solve problems for their customers every day, all day, every day. Yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. So. We have a question from Sarah uh, Mitchell. Uh, she wants to know, well, how has the evolution of technology helped you or perhaps hurt you as an investor? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I like to use a surfing analogy, like as a technology entrepreneur and investor, I don't wanna create waves, I wanna ride them, right? Like I wanna look off on the horizon and be in the right place at the right time for when that wave peaks, it breaks and I can ride it. Um, so technology helps me in that way. Cause there's like, it's constantly being disrupted, which means new it's creating opportunity for new entrants. Like I'll invest in a company, you know, 15 years ago or 10 years ago, and then they'll go on and be successful or maybe they won't, maybe it's too early, 
then 10 years later, I can invest in another company that's kind of disrupting that one from before, right? Like, because technology changed. Um, how this could hurt me is if I just don't stay up to date on things. Um, like, I am not, I didn't, you know, I had like uh, some Bitcoin in 2014, 15, you know, and just like, oh, this thing that's happening, a bunch of nerd friends were like talking about it. I didn't go like hardcore at it. Some of my friends did. Some of those friends have made insane money just on some of the tokens. But there, I truly think something very, very big is happening there. I don't have that many uh, great investments in the space. I had one and it sold. Um, and so I'm like, I'm probably a little, like that's a disruption where I'm like a little bit behind. But usually if I feel like I'm behind, I'm probably still really early. <laughs> And I'm, I'll be just fine. But that's that's the thing. Is just like you, technology is constantly changing. Uh, another thing that's changing is actually um, like the markets that are opening up. Like the geography is changing. Like my two most recent investments were in, are in Lagos, Nigeria, wow. and Mexico City. Wow. Those mar like a lot of the things that have like a lot of the things that have been farmed here already. Like the opportunities are gone. They're ripe there, and these companies are growing like like hockey stick and entry prices are lower and these founders are like you know going to be building career family you know city defining companies yeah no that that's actually interesting because you know recently obviously after the pandemic we have seen and even before the pandemic there's increasing tensions between the u.s and china and now you have all europe and i think there were some recent developments and on, on, on tariffs and everything that's going on to china and you have the pandemic leading countries to you know ensure and try to make things inside to assure the supply chain so like how do you how do you find those opportunities because it, it seems impressive how the world is trying to kind of like go back to that globalization trend but since i think 2010 we have been you know right down so what, what's your take on that um on the tech side software tech and kind of venture investing community it's more global than ever and wow. luckily like i came to silicon valley now 15 years ago the network that I have here is quite incredible. And, it, you know, we are still physical beings. So like when my kids are out, like on the street playing, it's like, I have, you know, within a stone's throw of our house, there's several startup founders, there's several VCs. And so like the community's tight. And so these, these others like Lagos, Nigeria, or like the founder from Mexico city, they don't have that level of density. So what they really look to somebody like me for is a bridge to this community here because I help them then raise the follow on financings. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of gives me access and uh, we are kind of a global community in terms of like looking at opportunity. Um, you know, we have a lot more in common with each other than frankly I do with people that, are, you know, live in some, you know, a lot of America actually in terms of like the things we're interested in the political alignments um there's there's like a global kind of start startup community it's a lot of people that see the world as like change is good like we can get better versus you know there's a lot of zero sum thinking uh, whenever resources feel tighter or you're uh, not you know not not exposed to the same levels of education and stuff yeah um going into that you know zero sum idea um I, I actually completely agree with that but my question is more into do you think it's you know let's say this awesome countries that you mentioned maybe mexico all these emerging markets trying to overtake this you know market at the us and, and that's why you have seen so many you know investments flew or capital flew to these countries or do you think it's more of like we're all growing together what were the two options? We're all growing together or or emerging markets overtaking, you know, developed nations like the US and in, in terms of capitals and investment? Um, I wouldn't say it's like overtaking. I would say that the prices are better. You know, it's gotten very expensive to invest in the US because there's a lot of capital trying to invest here. And then there's a lot of competition. Whereas like if you go to, you know, Lagos, like there's a lot of great entrepreneurs there. But um, your entry price is lower, and you know something that was ripe in, in San Francisco three years ago, four years ago is ripe there right now. Um, so a lot of it's kind of like 
kind of seeing what worked here and then trying to do it there. And uh, also actually, if a place doesn't have like the same infrastructure, we have a lot of legacy infrastructure in the US, like this whole uh, like payment processing thing with like Visa, MasterCard, et cetera. Or we all have like credit profiles because we have like these major credit agencies that have been around for a long time. In Latin America, like most people don't have a credit profile. It's like one of the companies that I invested in, like it's, it's a lot about how do you profile this other unbanked class of people? How do you actually give them a credit card based on a really you know, important personal need? Like they're, you know, they're going to create new ideas on different paths and what happened in the US. And so like they can actually leapfrog. And we've, we've seen this, we've seen other examples of this. We're seeing that in transportation, um, like the way that, you know, I started investing in micro mobility, electric bikes and scooters in like 2016, 2017. It was like right before it became this huge thing. The reason I did this uh, was I spent time in China at that time. And I was like, I'd, I saw just this explosion on their streets. And I was like, this is going to hit the rest of the world. It's such yeah. a big move. The mobikes were taking yeah. everyone. Impressive. Couldn't, couldn't agree more with that. Yeah. So we do have another question before we jump out of the investing topic and we jump a little more into the advising. But Luke would like to know, so do you feel pressured to find startups to invest in since you are managing other people's money? Or if it was just like your money and you could just invest whenever you want at your own pace? Yes, I have to manage that. That's a great question. Um, somebody like has some experience in the investing world, I think asking that, um, uh, managing my psychology now that I have some other people's money is a, is a major thing that I grapple with like basically every day, because I feel like so much of my sweet spot has been not feeling pressured and only going after things where I'm like, I really am excited about this. And so I'm, tr I try to set that expectation with my investors where it's like, hey, I might not do an investment this quarter. Or actually, I might need a recharge where I just like need to go travel with my family and just like not be looking at decks every day to just reset on where I think the world's going. I find like I get great inspiration and thinking coming out of that. Like I just need to read a bunch of books and travel and that will make me better investing. And so I have a time horizon with my investors that says like, hey, a lot of funds they're very focused on like the management fee. They're trying to churn through funds every two years. I'm like, I might invest this over a four year period. Um, and, you know, like I don't, I'm not doing this for the management fee. And um, yeah, I just want to make great investments like I have done. So yeah, thank you for asking this. This is a, it is a personal <laughs> ongoing struggle. I can imagine. So I would like to jump a little more into your advising roles. And, and I know you have taken a couple of them, but could you walk us a little more about how does that go about? Do you reach out to startups? Do startups reach out to you? And, and how does the relationship as an advisor work? Yeah. So they reach out to me. Um, I don't like to do an advising roles where I'm also not investing. So I always invest as well. Um, and generally, I found that I'm the role where I've been the most effective advisor is if somebody it's, it's almost always like entrepreneurs that are earlier in their career, like they haven't done this a bunch of times. And very often it's actually founders that are solo founders and don't have a co-founder or they don't have a co-founder yet. So it's early, very early. I mean, I have like five examples of this where it was like somebody who I think is just super impressive. I really like what they're working on. They had like a co-founder leave or like never have, haven't found one yet. And so they need somebody else to talk to on like Wednesday night when they're trying to like make a decision about like, should I let this investor into the company or, um, you know, hey, like I need another opinion on like somebody that I might want to bring in as a co-founder. That's when I'm best because I've been the co-founder before and this has worked out really well. Like the companies that I've done this for, knock on wood or, you know, looking like they're going to be great returns for my investment and for my time. So I have, uh, I've got one of those right now. Um, and now with the fund, I actually, um, all the advising equity is shared among all LPs. So it's, yeah. it doesn't go to me. Yeah. So LPs for people not familiar with the matter is investors in the fund, but yeah. So jumping a little more into the advising, how frequently companies look for your guidance? Is this once a week? Is this once a month? 
Is it just when something, a development comes up? So we should be clear, like, I have like formal advising roles with some companies at some times, but then like, frankly, every company that I invest in, part of the, what I'm doing is like, they're expecting I'm going to help them. So um, let's, let's just talk broadly. Companies that I invest in, like I mostly am uh, helpful at times when something big is going on in the company. And it's usually something around transacting shares in the company. So it's like raising money, hiring people, or selling the business. Those are the most important times that like, because I do this all the time, right? I've been part of 15 M&A transactions. Like I helped with it. Actually, you can see this keyboard in the background of my picture here right now. Yep. I, I helped with a deal uh, like last week, or two weeks ago. Like I was like the, for these co-founders, they're selling their business. I was like the person to help them through the whole process. And this is a sweet 1970s Fender Rhodes keyboard. That was their gift for me, just like dedicating all the, you know, I, got upside in the deal too, but like they were so thankful for my help. So that's, I get deeply involved when that kind of stuff's going on. And I actually like it because it actually strengthens my skills. Um, this deal that I helped on, like made me better for the next deal that I'm helping on. So those are more spiky. Then you talk about this first group where you don't have a co-founder and you like just need that other person to talk to. And I'm like more in a deep advisory role. That usually is more intense for like a six month period where it's like, I'm talking to them every couple of days. Sometimes it's for like an hour and a half on a Wednesday night. Um, and then it generally trails off over time. But I have one of those companies. I, I did that seven years ago. The company's now, you know, doing 40 million in revenue. The founders got hundreds of employees. We still have a standing call on Tuesdays, uh, every other Tuesday. And we use it maybe once out of every three times. Well, he'll send me a text like, hey, you know, can you catch up? And we just we just talk about stress and life and running a company. And, um, you know, these people become friends. Like, you know, it's a pretty intimate thing building a company together. And one of the reasons I love what I do is that I think entrepreneurs are the most interesting people on the planet because they're like just the most motivated, hungry people. And they're usually people that things weren't given to. Many, many of the founders are are uh, immigrants or uh, children of immigrants, and they are trying to um, they're trying to change the world, and they're also trying to like, you know, create a new trajectory for their family. Like we weren't given weren't given this. They're creating something, and uh, I find those people really inspiring. Awesome. So, with that, um. I would love to um, ask you a question about that Katie Adams just said that it's more about your perspective and, and your background and your experience and perhaps the experience of the, some of the entrepreneurs that you advise. But her question is, um, what are some of the daily habits that you have built into your life that allow you to be such a successful entrepreneur or perhaps habits that you have eliminated? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so one of my favorite, and uh, this is just like, core to, to my values now is I, when I was in grad school, I did like an internship at the Naval Research Lab. And I had to like get in a car and drive on a highway for like 30 minutes every day to like this location. I'd get there and it's like traffic's stressful. I find driving stressful. I would come home so tired. And I said, I'm going to build a company that me and my employees can walk or ride our bikes to. And that was like a really important value that I wanted in like in my career. I just did not want to be sitting in a car in traffic, stressed out and tired when I get home. And I think that has been one of the best decisions that I made for my employees and for my own health. Um, people that commute by walking and biking are the happiest of all commuters. You have exercise built into your day. There's a Harvard study that says like, if you exercise for 10 or 15 minutes, and we're not talking sweat, sweat exercise, but just like a little bit, like you're 40% more creative for like the next hour. So I, I get into work and I've, and I'm like ready to go. I don't need it. I don't even need the coffee, for example, to start. And then, um, and then riding home, you like process this stuff or walking or you process this and then you can come home and actually, you know, you're not stressed about finding parking and dealing with traffic. Like you're just there for your family. So I think this is one of the most important things um, that I've added. And, and actually one of the things I coach founders on relates to this, which is like the best antidote for stress 
and to be effective is exercise. And so there's points in my company, like the second company was really stressful going through the M&A process. And I um, offloaded a lot of my internal responsibilities to my co-founder. And I said, my only job is to get this deal done and to be available emotionally when I'm needed for progressing this deal. And so we had a pool across the street, you know, downtown San Francisco where I was working. And I would just, if I had a window in time, any, like any day, every day, I would just like go swim for 40 minutes which I find, I think swimming is the best exercise. And then, um, you know, I was just like emotionally, physically zen and available to be kick-ass in my job. And that's more important than like, oh, can I crank out another email? So uh, healthy body, healthy mind. That's probably the top thing that I would say on this. Any any resources, books, for, or that you will recommend in, in the matter? Um. Well, I'm, I'm actually personally dealing with a bit of a health uh, journey right now because I got COVID in uh, July and I'm an unfortunate sufferer from long COVID. So I've had chest pain, back pain, throat pain. That's why I'm drinking a lot of water. It's actually hurting right now. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think some of the things that I've been learning through this process will help uh, after I'm through this, as I hope I will get through it. And that's been around what I eat. Um, uh, fasting, one of the best tools I've come to is fasting for helping my body heal itself. And what I, there's a lot of talk about intermittent fasting. I can do that. But what I really like is like 48 hour water fasts. And that's one of the best ways that I've healed myself as I've gotten a little bit older when I've gone through health challenges. Um, and then I've been doing uh, Wim Hof breathing, which is, you know, it's like better than a drug like this. You can look it up, but it's just this great breathing exercise that um, you hyper oxygenate your lungs. I can hold my breath for over four minutes. Um, wow. And then I, and I do cold showers after that. Um, and then I just try to like get out in nature and try to get there by walking or taking a bike or taking the bus. That's awesome. Yeah. So let me um, actually jump in here and ask, question about look so he would like to know you're surrounded about all these you know awesome and, and innovative people and you know you're looking constantly to all of these startup founders and exciting ideas do you ever want to start another company and and as a follow-up you would like to jump in and add if you were to start another company what would it be or in what industry would it be yeah um so I, I kind of have this itch scratched right now by uh, the activism that I do around trying to reduce car dominance on our city streets. Um, so, you know, my phone is blowing up right now because, you know, I did a huge rally this past weekend, um, press interviews, you know, uh, talking to like state senators scheduled for tomorrow, like lots of that going on. I'm building something. There's a coalition of people. We're raising money. We're pushing a narrative. Um, so I kind of can scratch that itch on something. And one of the reasons I chose it is that it benefits me, but then also benefits our planet and benefits other humans and other species that live here. And, um, you know, like it's never gonna make me money because I, you know, in a lot of ways I've solved the money problem. I don't need to like do something to make more money for my family. So um, that's kind of my startup. And I think future startups might be more along that line. Like I probably won't build some like B2B business product because the everyday intricacies of that, I'm just like not that interested in. I've done it a lot um, and I help other people do it, but like, do I wanna do that every day, all day? Probably not. Like more likely, my wife's a teacher, more likely her and I will like start a school or maybe a summer school. Um, I could see, uh, I wanna start an initiative to get um, family e-cargo bikes into the hands of underprivileged communities and do that school by school. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I'm at in starting a company. And I'll also add, yeah. like, I, I can't actually mentally commit to starting a company right now because I have a two and a half year old and a 10 month old. Wow. And the, the w way that I get obsessed about my work would be just unhealthy for me to be like, I, I'm not balanced enough to do that and like be a great dad. So that's yeah. probably holding me back right now too. And well, for, 
everyone here that is joining and joining us and done know. I mean, you already do have a, a summer school right here at Penn State. Um, you are That's the right. founder and also support the founders summer program at Launchpad. So, would you like to to give a shout out to that? Yeah. So we started summer founders program at Penn State over five years ago, maybe six years now. The concept was like Y Combinator was getting like more and more. Um, prestige and harder to get into. And there was nothing really like what I had um, as a startup founder when YC was early. And so we created that version at Penn State, raised money from the founders of Weebly, myself, one of the partners at YC. And uh, the idea is that, hey, instead of taking an internship, we want to support you and working on your startup for the summer and hopefully longer. And so anybody here, um, when you have your idea and you have some work to show us, you should be applying. We do it every summer. Uh, there's five or six great companies in it this summer. And that is kind of my summer program. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So there's, I think, probably two questions, the time for two more questions. So the last question here is from Amanda Stressler. And she would like to know, what are your experiences working with B Corps? Uh, do you have a colleagues who work on B Corps? And would you love to hear your insights there? I do not have that much experience on B Corps. I've experienced in nonprofits and for-profits, that middle zone, I probably just leave it there. I do not have that much experience. Got it. Okay. And with that, um, I, I would like to pose this last question. Perhaps we can have uh, time for one more then, but if you could go back in time, uh, Matt, knowing what you know right now, what if anything would you do differently? Tough question, uh, actually, black question of the exam. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would have pushed harder against investors that were forcing a CEO on our company, on our first company. So this, this happened to us. Uh, it's the reason I think the company didn't achieve what it could have achieved. We thought we were going to be, we, we had a deal signed to sell to Microsoft at the time. So I was kind of like, F it fine, put a CEO in, we're going to be done anyway soon. The deal fell apart with Microsoft. We had a CEO who ramped burn, didn't understand our customer as well as we did, and didn't allow us to like mature as a company, just like accelerated us to like a big company when we weren't a big company yet. And, you know, that cost me a lot of money and a lot of grief. It was a mistake. That was, that's the number one thing. The only thing that's been good about that is that I learned so much from that process that I could keep other founders from making that mistake. Definitely. So just to leave it here, um, do you have any last uh, advice or, or some comments for Penn State students that are either founders themselves or are interested in being founders or just you know interested in working at startups? Yeah. Um, first, I want to say, Leonardo, you did such a great job moderating this. Uh, Appreciate like it. impressive. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and to everybody's questions, they were really, really good. This is a great group of people. Um, my advice would be just to build things with other smart people. So, and it, it does not have to end up being a business. Like the best experiences I had in college and frankly, even now are like these things when you just have a passion that you just want to nerd out on these type of passions where you like find one book on the topic, you're like, I want to read everything about this. And then you go to the library and you find that book and then you just read everything on both sides of it, right? Find those types of things and then find people to go and nerd out and build stuff with. And that will just turn into great opportunities for you, friendships and um, put you on a good track to building probably a successful business someday. Yeah, definitely. I'll definitely jump in here for a second and say that um, you know, we have really at Penn State a lot of resources. I mean, just even thinking about all the resources provided by Penn State and all the faculty and staff and, and Penn State and the university, but also student organizations like Happy Valley Capital, like InnoBlue, that are, you know, day in and day out, every single time working to make all this ecosystem more collaborative and, and prosperous for everyone, all the entrepreneurs here. So with that, um, I'd love to, to pass it in to the staff from uh, Startup Week that certainly did an awesome job and, and I'm really thankful for. So thanks everyone for joining. See ya. Thank you. So in conclusion, we want to thank both, both Matt Brazine and Leonardo Ghirlando for our engaging discussion this evening. I also loved the engage the level of engagement with questions that were shared and that were answered. 
So thanks to all the attendees this evening. As a reminder, at 7.15, so in 15 minutes from now, grab, refresh your beverage because we you have other things to watch. Um, there's an additional financing panel, finding the right egg for your basket, modern financing options for your venture. And during this, we have panelists from venture capital, equity crowdfunding, corporate incubators. So please join us again in 15 minutes. And there is, um, there's the, oh, actually we just put that in the, the chat for the next panel. And there's, there's still two more days of startup week. So something for everything, everyone. As you can see, there's a tremendous ecosystem here at Penn State for inspiring um, entrepreneurs. And we appreciate your involvement and thank you very much.